Well, good evening. Good evening. I hope everyone's doing well tonight. It's a joy to be with you. Thank you for very much for coming back. Uh, just briefly before we get into the teaching, let me let me give you do a little bit of housekeeping stuff. As Pastor Chuck said, I do have some resources available for you if you'd like the the seminar. It's I have it available on a DVD set, Clouds Without Water. It's about seven hours of teaching on this, and uh, I have it in Spanish too. So if you have any Spanish speaking friends or family members that would benefit from this, I have it in Spanish, Nube Sinagua, Clouds Without Water. And uh, this is a, it's, I call this a discernment mini pack for lack of a better title, discernment mini pack. This is a collection of four different articles I've written on four different topics. One is uh, a critique of the Message Bible by Eugene Peterson. I'm sure most of you have seen The Message by Eugene Peterson. Uh, if you have a copy of The Message, you can use it for uh, kindling. You can use it for target practice. If you need to sight your gun in, it's really good for that. Please don't think you're reading God's Word when you're reading The Message. You are not. Uh, the Message compromises and denies some of the fundamental doctrines of Christianity. I've taken a number of verses very common verses, verses that we all know, and do a just a comparison. I have them from the message in the King James, New American Standard, NIV, put them side by side, and the message it has jaw-dropping heresy in it. it. It is very, very bad. You are not reading the Bible when you're reading the message. I have a, an article entitled, Your Best Afterlife Now, which is a critique of people who claim to have been to heaven, and we'll talk about that tomorrow night. A review of the Son of God movie, Roma Downey, Mark Barnett. I've been producing Christian, quote unquote, quote unquote, Christian movies. A uh, review of that movie. And then the, an article I've entitled, entitled Santa Pauls. And uh, I don't know if you've ever really given much thought to Santa. Have you, ever, have you ever thought about how much like God Santa Claus looks? Santa has most of God's attributes. Santa is omnipresent, he goes around the world in one night. He is eternal. Santa never dies, never seems to get old. He's just there year after year after year. He's, uh, he's omniscient. He knows if you've been sleeping. He knows if you're awake. He gives good gifts, and yet we know that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. And uh, so it's, it's interesting. Uh, God is a jealous God. What is he jealous of? More like what is he jealous for? He is jealous for himself, and he will not share his glory with another. God is the summation of his attributes, and he will not share his glory with another, does not share his attributes, his, what we call his incommunicable attributes, his omnipresence, his omniscience. He does not share those with us. Communicable attributes we could talk about, but not, not incommunicable. Anyway, that's a... Uh, a resource available for you. And then kind of talk about these in tandem. This is a six CD set on spiritual warfare. Uh, this, I've interviewed my pastor, Jim Osmond, who wrote this book on spiritual warfare. The title of this book is Truth or Territory. And basically the audio covers a lot of what's in here, but there's some overlap. You know, there's some stuff in here that's not in here and vice versa. But uh, both of these resources deal with spiritual warfare, real spiritual warfare. Now, if you listen to the modern experts, modern spiritual warfare experts, they would tell you that spiritual warfare entails rebuking Satan, breaking generational curses, uh, spiritual mapping, um, Binding Satan, things like this. You ever wondered about that, binding Satan? All these people going around binding Satan, somebody sure keeps letting him back out. You know, who's that guy? Maybe you ought to bind the fellow that keeps untying him. You know, bind him. You know, and my Bible says that Satan prowls about like a roaring lion. I don't think he's very bound. That doesn't sound very bound to me. So if you've ever wondered about that, it's because none of this stuff is biblical. None of it's biblical. Spiritual warfare, as the title of this book implies, 
It's not a battle for territory. It's a battle for truth. We're not trying to take back territory from Satan. Okay, that's not spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is a battle for truth. It's a battle for, for men's minds over truth. That's what spiritual warfare is about. So anyway, really good, helpful resource for you. The prices of these are listed out there, but let me also say, if the, if the cost is in any way prohibitive to you, don't worry about it. I want you to be equipped to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15, that's why I'm here. So if money is tight and you need these resources, that's fine. You don't even have to ask me, just help yourself. So those, those are available for you. These are just little cards. Do not hinder them. That's the title of the book that I've just written. The books should be out within a, a month or so. It will be on my website. But uh, do not hinder them. A little bit of a little summary of that book, a little synopsis. And so just a, a little reminder if you would like that book when it's out in a few weeks. And uh, my website there where you can get it. If you'd like to go on a cruise, um, I will be, <laughs> yeah, I've never been on a cruise before. But I was, believe it or not, I was asked to, to be a speaker on a cruise next year in May, and it, the title of the cruise is Footsteps of Paul, and we're going to go to places that Paul was. We're going to go to uh, Thessaloniki. We talked about Thessaloniki this morning. We're going to go to Berea, so I'm looking forward to that. We're going to go to Philippi, to Neapolis. We're going to go to Corinth, Mars Hill, Parthenon, uh, Athens, uh, Ephesus, and we'll be at Patmos. So, a lot of the places in your Bible that you read about, we're going to go to next year. And I will be teaching, and so will Pastor Brian Hughes, pastor of Grace Bible Church in Bozeman, Montana. He's a friend of mine. Excellent, excellent, excellent Bible teacher. So anyway, those, and I have newsletters, and those are free. Those newsletters on the table, just grab you one of those. Okay, all right, all that out of the way. Let's go to the Lord in word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Father, thank you for this time that you've given to us and all those who have gathered here tonight. We pray that, uh, once again, we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us into the truth of your word. Sanctify us in your truth. Thy word is truth. These things we ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, tonight's session is entitled Dangerous Doctrines. Tonight we will be looking at the metaphysical cultic origins of of the word faith movement and the standard doctrines which the faith preachers teach that deviate from historical Christianity. By the end of our time together tonight, probably go about an hour and a half or so, uh, we'll see that the prosperity gospel is indeed a different gospel altogether. I want us to begin by looking at this, these couple of verses out of the book of Jude. Jude writes, he said, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. What Jude was writing, what he was saying to his readers, basically he was saying, I tried to write to you just about our common salvation, about the gospel. Jude was saying, I wish that all we had to do was talk about the gospel. I wish that that's all we had to talk about. But I felt it needful. I felt it necessary to write to you, to exhort you, to, that you earnestly contend for the faith. Why? He says, because certain men have crept in unnoticed. False teachers crept in, have crept in unnoticed. It would be wonderful, dear friends, if all we had to do was preach the gospel, talk about the gospel, and never have to worry about false teachers. But false teachers have been a problem in the church practically since its inception, and they remain so today. Do you know that 25 of the 27 books in our New Testament, 25 of them, directly warn about false teachers? 25 of the 27. So warning about false teachers is a very prominent theme in our New Testaments. So where did the Word of Faith movement begin? In order to understand a movement, it really helps to have a working knowledge of the origins of that movement. Where did the Word of Faith movement begin? It began with a man named Phineas Parkhurst Quimby. We could call Quimby the great-grandfather 
of the word faith movement. He's the one that first began to articulate some of the doctrines that we see today. Quimby was the father of New Thought, a metaphysical cult. And when I say metaphysical, that's a big word, but all it really means is beyond the physical realm, beyond what we can see and touch here. And when I say cult, I mean any group or sect that may call itself Christian, yet compromises or denies some of the fundamentals of the faith. Mormonism is a cult. Jehovah's Witnesses belong to a cult. Roman Catholicism is a theological cult. Now, not a sociological cult, not a Jim Jones drink the Kool-Aid kind of a cult, but it is a theological cult because it compromises and denies some of the fundamental doctrines of historical Christianity. Quimby was the father of the metaphysical cult known as New Thought. New Thought basically held that whatever you think about, you will attract to yourself. So if you think positive thoughts, your thoughts will go out there into space somewhere and your positive thoughts will enact universal laws of attraction. And then the universe will bring to you positive things. Conversely, if you think negative thoughts, then your negative thoughts will bring negative things to you. Law of attraction, also known as the secret that Oprah Winfrey has been promoting in the last 10, 12 years or so, the secret. Ladies, don't be getting your theology from Oprah. Quimby was a student of occultism, hypnosis, parapsychology, and his theoretical formulation served as a basis for what is today known as Christian science. You've probably heard of Christian science. Mary Baker Eddy claimed that she was physically healed by Phineas Quimby. She really wasn't, but she said she was. And then she took his doctrines and developed them further, and from that formed what is today known as Christian science. And Christian science is very poorly named, by the way, because Christian science is neither Christian nor is it scientific. Kind of like grape nuts, you know. <laughs> they're not grape and they're not nuts. It, <laughs> I don't know where they came up with the name for grape nuts. Uh, Christian science is not Christian and it's not scientific. But there's a lot of Christian science overtones in the modern word of faith movement. One of which is the denial of physical symptoms when it comes to sickness and disease. If you have a friend or a family member who is in this movement to one degree or another, you might notice that if they get sick, they deny that they're sick. You ask them, well, how are you doing? Maybe they've got a cold. And you ask them, well, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. You know, maybe their eyes are watering, their nose is running, they're congested, they're sneezy, you know, coffee, stuffy head fever so you can rest medicine, all that stuff. Clearly they're sick, but they deny it. Well, that's Christian science. No, I'm not going to confess that. No, if I, I'm not going to confess. Well, whatever you confess, you bring into reality. It's Christian science. Watch this from Andrew Womack as evidence of this. Andrew Womack. If you are reaping sickness, it's because you've thought sickness. It may not be that you've thought, all right, I want to be sick. But you've thought things that allow sickness to dominate you. Such things as, well, I'm only human. I'm just a man. It's flu season. i got to get sick because it's flu season. You may not have sat there and have thought, I want the flu. But you've thought things that made you inferior to flu and that made you only human. You were denying and not focused on who you are in Christ, that no plague will come nigh your dwelling. And you have thought things that made you susceptible to Satan stealing your health so if you're sick it's your fault because you've been thinking sick thoughts and you attract sickness to you that's christian science that's that's new thought it's, it's cultic so the word of faith movement is nothing more than cultic theology wrapped in some christianese wrapped in some christian lingo to make it appear to be christian when it is anything but Essek W. Kenyon, we could call the grandfather of the modern word faith movement. Kenyon had very clear ties to the metaphysical cults, particularly New Age and New Thought. He attended college at the Emerson School of Oratory in Boston where the metaphysical cults flourished and he was heavily influenced by them. Kenyon did have some things right, okay? He wasn't wrong on everything. He had some things right, but he had a lot of things wrong as well. 
For example, he, cre he taught that God created not ex nihilo, in other words, not out of nothing, but rather God created by speaking faith-filled words. In other words, Kenyon taught that when God spoke, his words were containers of a tangible substance called faith, almost like you put spaghetti in a Tupperware uh, bowl or whatever. God's words were the containers of a tangible substance called faith. And that's how God created. And you and I as Christians, we can use our own words of faith to speak things into existence, create our own physical reality. He taught that everything is made of faith. Everything's made. If you were to, if you were to, the, the chair you're sitting on is made of faith, according to Kenyon and the modern word of faith preachers. You know, if you were to break down the chair that you're sitting on to its most basic elements, you wouldn't find atoms and molecules. You'd find faith. The clothes you're wearing, the car you're driving, you know, the, the shoes on your feet, it, it, they're made of faith. And we as believers, we can use our own words of faith to create our own reality. He held that humans took on the nature of Satan in the fall. When this happened, they forfeited to Satan their supposed deity and made Satan the legal god of planet Earth. Dear friends, Satan is not the legal god of planet Earth. God is the legal god of planet Earth. The Earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Well, you may be wondering, well, what about what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 4? He said, and the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. The better way to render that is, the, Paul says, the God of this age. The word in the Greek is aeon, which literally means age. Paul wasn't referring to this physical planet. Paul was making a theological point, not a legal point. He was saying this world is so sinful, so fallen, so depraved, that it follows after Satan as if he were the god of this age, but not the legal god of planet Earth. Okay, it's not what Paul was saying. God is the legal god of planet Earth. Always has been, is now, and always will be. Hallelujah. Kenyon held that Jesus died not only a physical death, but he also died a spiritual death. He held that when Jesus died on the cross, the work of the atonement had just begun. When Jesus died on the cross, then he went to hell suffered, was tormented, tortured by demons, died a spiritual death in hell, ceased to be God, and had to be reborn. They actually teach that Jesus had to get saved. And this is a standard doctrine in the Word Faith Movement. Standard. All of them teach it. Joyce Meyer teaches it. And finally, he held that health and wealth are obtainable by the believer's positive confession. So if you need money, you speak it into existence. You need healing, you speak it into existence. Whatever you speak, you'll create. Kenneth Hagin, we could call the father of the modern word faith movement, despite Kenneth Hagin's teaching that no Christian should die until he's at least 120 years old. You see, Kenneth Hagin didn't quite make it. He died uh, just a little bit shy of his 86th birthday. But like all the faith preachers, Kenneth Hagin claimed that much of what he taught people, he received directly through divine revelation knowledge. And this was their way of insulating themselves against biblical criticism. And they'll say, as Hagin did, he said, well, if you can't find what I'm teaching you in the scriptures, uh, don't worry about it, you see, because I have it from the highest authority. Jesus himself came and gave me these teachings. So if you can't find it in the Word, don't worry about it. It's okay. I got it from Jesus. Hagen claimed that Jesus physically appeared to him on eight different occasions throughout the course of his life. And on one of these occasions, according to Hagen, Jesus gave him these exact words. He says that Jesus physically showed up and gave him these words. It's interesting, however, that Jesus apparently bears a striking resemblance to Essek W. Kenyon. If you can see, it's practically word for word identical. Hagen did not get this from Jesus. Hagen plagiarized Essek W. Kenyon. And this is just all I could fit on the screen. His plagiarism is quite voluminous. And he plagiarized other authors as well. So uh, the faith preachers are very fond of claiming divine origin for what they teach. But as you can see, the origins are not nearly so supernatural plagiarist. 
I want us now to look at the doctrines of the Word Faith Movement. We'll begin by looking at the doctrine known as positive confession, that we can speak things into existence. Watch these short clips. Look at me, say, 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 all, all of you, say, there's power in me. Speak life and death. You call what you have. You say what you want. And I'm here to tell you, I know that I know that I know that as these programs are airing, I am speaking something into existence. Amen. I'm speaking something into existence. If that sounds eerily like God's act of creation in Genesis 1 and 2, that's because it is. Dear friends, only God can speak things into existence. That is something that only God can do. The Hebrew, the Hebrew word for create is bara, to, to create out of nothing. And friends, only God baras. That is something that only God can do. The faith preachers blur that line between God the creator and us his created. They demote God to make him look more human than what he is. And then in turn, they deify man, and they make us look a lot more like God than what we really are. Now, you may be thinking, oh, well, Justin, come on. You don't, you're taking these people out of context, aren't you? I mean, they don't really teach that you can speak things into existence just like God did. They don't actually teach that, right? Actually, they do. This is a tweet from Creflo Dollar. Creflo Dollar tweeted this a couple years ago. He says, as spiritual beings who possess the nature of God, we have the ability to speak things into existence just like God did. So yes, they do teach this. Make no mistake about it. Yes, they do. This from T.D. Jakes. T.D. Jake says that word of God is how God procreates. It's how God regenerates. Is God regenerating? I don't think he's wearing out, is he? And that's why once you get in the word of God, you've got to be careful what you speak to because the power of life and death is in your tongue. Is it? Is there any Bible to support this, that we have the power of life and death in our tongues? Well, upon first blush, it might would seem that there is. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Oh, wow. Well, doesn't it say that right there that we have the power of life and death in our tongue? Well, as is common with the prosperity preachers, they only, they'll, they'll take a verse out of its context. And you take a verse out of its context, you can make the Bible say just about whatever you want it to say. They take it out of its context, and sometimes they don't even quote the whole verse to you. And actually with this, they're making both errors. Let me show you the entire verse. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So you see, when you read the whole verse, it doesn't say exactly what the faith preachers claim that it does, does it? This is not saying we can speak things into existence. This is actually a warning. Let me show you what Alan Ross says in this, about this in the expositor's commentary. He says, those who enjoy talking, in other words, indulging in it, must bear its fruit, whether good or bad. The lesson is to be warned, especially if you love to talk. This is a warning. Now, do our words have impact on people? Absolutely. There's a reason that James warns us about the dangers of the unbridled tongue. Absolutely. But we don't literally have the ability to speak things into existence. That's not what this verse is saying. Not at all. Only God can do that. Listen to this conversation between Kenneth Copeland and Paul and Jen Crouch. Does God use faith? Surely. Now, now see, here's a sore spot. There are those not with who him. say. Not with, not, not with you. No, no, no. <laughs> not with God. I'm not, in fact, I'm not sore at God at all, and I don't think he's sore at me. I don't know. I haven't done anything to him. No, but the, the critics say God is God. He doesn't have to have faith. He doesn't exercise faith. He doesn't use faith. He's God. He's the object of faith. Oh, wait a minute. What does that mean? Object? I don't know what that means. I don't either. Um, 
Did you hear that? Kenneth Copeland said, now wait a minute, what's that mean, God is the object of our faith? I don't know what that means. And then you hear Jan Crouch say, well, I don't either. Friends, that's not meat. That's milk. The fact that God is the object of our faith, I mean, it doesn't get more basic than that. That's Christianity 101. That's first grade Sunday school. That's ground level. And it's amazing to me that these people who claim to be our leaders in Christianity, they'll flat out tell you, I, I don't know what that means, God's object of our faith. What does that mean? You see, because in the prosperity gospel, God's not the object of faith. Faith is the object of faith. In the word faith movement, faith is not placed in God. Faith is a force that you direct at God to make him do whatever you want him to do. God in, in the word of faith movement is a, is a cosmic bellhop. And you use your faith to make him do whatever you want him to do and he's Johnny on the spot and he'll do it for you. And once again, you, you, maybe you're saying, oh, well, they don't actually teach that you should have faith in your faith. I mean, you they don't really teach that, do you? Do they have faith in your faith? Yeah, actually they do teach that. This from Jesse Duplantis. He writes in his magazine, Voice of the Covenant, the Bible says that every man has been given the measure of faith. Have faith in your faith, not faith in God. Have faith in your faith and step over into the faith zone, whatever that is. How strong are our words? Well, our words are so powerful that if you don't like the weather, well, you can just change it. Watch this from Gloria Copeland. You know, you're, the, you're supposed to control the weather. I mean, Ken's the primary weatherman at our house, but when he's not there, I do it. He can see what's happening out there. It shows just like they have on at the weather, like on the news. I mean, he's got the computer, got the current weather on it and all that for flying. So uh, sometimes I'll hear something. I'll hear the thunder start. Maybe he'll still be asleep. And I'll say, Ken, you need to do something about this. <laughs> And knowing that, but you are the one that has authority over the weather. One day, Ken and Pat Boone, we were in Hawaii at their house, and we were, they were sitting outside, and there was a weather spout out over the ocean. And that's like a tornado, except it hits the water. And so they were sitting there, and they just watched it, rebuked it, it never did anything. One day, I was in the airplane in the back, and my little brother was in the back with me, and Ken was up front flying, and we were not in the weather because we don't fly bad weather, but we, we could see the weather over here. And I looked out the window, and that tornado came down just like this, down toward the ground, and Ken said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You get back up there. So this is how I learned how to talk to tornadoes. I saw this, and that tornado went, whoop, 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 whoop. Even while I was watching, and my little brother was not a devout Christian at that time, and that was really good for him to see. <laughs> so you're the weatherman. You get out there, or the weather woman, whichever it is, and you talk to that thing, and you tell it, you're not coming here. I command you to dissipate, and you get back up there in Jesus' name. Glory to God. That, that, I won't charge you extra. Now, that really doesn't even deserve or need a comment, but if you'll indulge me, I'll offer a couple real quick ones. Did you notice how she says, we can control the weather, but we don't fly in bad weather? That's hilarious. Why not? I mean, if you can control the weather, fly through whatever you want to fly through. You know, honestly, just a little, aside from the theology, just a little common sense goes a long way in clearing a lot of this junk up. But if it is true, if it is true, and that's a huge if, but if it is true that Gloria Copeland, and it's not just Gloria Copeland, Kenneth Copeland, her husband, says he can do it. Creflo Dollar says, in fact, just a couple weeks ago, Creflo Dollar said he can control the weather. Jesse Duplantis, Rod Parsley, they all say they can control the weather. If that's true, then I would submit to you that these prosperity preachers should be charged with thousands of of cases of negligent homicide every year. Because every year, all around the world, there are thousands of people who die 
in weather-related disasters. Fires that could be put out with some rain. How many people die of starvation because of drought? Blizzards, floods, hurricanes, torna tornadoes. Where was, he, where was he this past week when Louisiana went underwater? If they, can, if they can control the weather, but they're just too lazy or narcissistic to do anything about it, then they ought to be charged with negligent homicide. But you know, I'm not really that hard-nosed. I don't actually think that the prosperity preachers should really be charged with negligent homicide because they can't do what they say they can do. They're liars. There's only one who can control the weather. And it's none of them. You know what's interesting? Do you remember last December, December 28th, 2015? Do you remember the tornadoes that hit Dallas-Fort Worth? Remember that? 11 people were killed. Kenneth Copeland put out this, um, what is this? I think it's a tweet. Kenneth Copeland put this out. He said, the people of Texas need your prayers. Deadly tornadoes struck the Dallas-Fort Worth area last night, killing at least 11 people. Homes, businesses, and churches have been destroyed. Please pray for all involved. Your wife just said that y'all can control tornadoes. Make them go away. By the way, do you know where Kenneth and Glory Copeland live? Fort Worth, Texas. I'm sure all of the family members who lost loved ones, they would much rather have had you do something about the tornadoes, Ken, than pray for them after the fact. So keep your stupid prayers. Thanks anyway. This from John Hagee. Oh, John Hagee. John Hagee's not word of faith, is he? Oh, yes, he is. I believe that when a person says, I wish I were dead, he or she invites the spirit of death to invade his or her life. When an unhappy wife says, my marriage is a failure, she has pronounced the doom of this relationship. When a pregnant mother says, I don't want this baby, she is pronouncing the termination of her pregnancy or a curse upon the life of a child yet to be born. Speech is that powerful. Is it really? So according to John Hagee, if a pregnant mother, for just whatever reason, happens to verbalize the words, I don't want this baby, she can kill her baby in utero. Where is the sovereignty of God in all of this? The prosperity preachers have no concept of God's sovereignty. None. The God of the prosperity gospel, little g God, is a very weak very effeminate, very indecisive God. And it is not the God of the Bible. It's not the God of the Bible. You remember in Luke's gospel when the angel gave the announcement to Mary and Elizabeth that they were going to have a baby? Remember this? And, of course, that baby would be John the Baptist. Well, Elizabeth and Zechariah were older, right? They were advanced in years. And uh, when Zechariah heard about this, he questioned it a little bit didn't he? And what did God do in response to Zechariah's questioning? What did he do? Closed his mouth, made him a mute. For a very interesting take on why God closed Zechariah's mouth, this from Joel Osteen. Osteen says, why did God take away his speech? It's because God knew that Zechariah's negative words would cancel out his plan. You see, God knows the power of our words. He knows that we prophesy our future, and he knew Zechariah's own negative words would stop his plan. Wow. So according to Joel Osteen, God was up in heaven looking down, and God saw Zechariah making negative confessions, and God just went into a panic. Oh, my goodness, what am I ever going to do? I, I wasn't counting on this. And so in a last-ditch effort, effort to save his plan of redemption... God had to reach down and close Zechariah's mouth and make him a mute. Whew. Boy, that was a close one. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. No concept of the sovereignty of God. This is an interesting photograph. Well, not really a photograph, a picture of a book. 
Uh, a friend of mine showed this to me a couple of years ago. He was in a bookstore, Barnes & Noble, I think. But he was in the New Age section of Barnes & Noble, and he saw this book, Supreme Influence. Subtitle, Change Your Life with the Power of the Language You Use. Nothing Christian about this book does not pretend to be Christian. It's New Age. Now, for comparison, let me show you a quote-unquote Christian book by Joyce Meyer. Change your words, change your life, understanding the power of every word you speak. You see, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. This is cultic theology wrapped in some Christianese, wrapped in some Christian lingo. Nothing Christian about it. It's cultic. Cultic. Speaking things into existence leads us to our next doctrine, the little God's doctrine. All of the faith preachers teach that if you are a Christian, you are in fact a little God. Watch this video clip from Creflo Dollar. Now, in verse 26 and verse 27, God now submits himself to this principle of everything producing after its own kind. And in verse 26 and 27, let's read it out loud. Ready? Read. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now that's interesting because if everything produces after its own kind, we now see God producing man. And if God now produces man, and everything produces after its own kind, If horses get together, they produce what? And if dogs get together, they produce what? If cats get together, they produce what? But if the Godhead gets together and say, let us make man, then what are they producing? They're producing gods. Now, I got to hit this thing real hard in the very beginning because I ain't got time to go through all this. But I'm going to say to you right now, you are gods, little g. You are gods because you came from God and you are gods. You're not just human. The only human part about you is this physical body that you live in. The real me is just like God. The real me is just like God. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Dear friends, when the Bible says that God created man in his image, that means that as human beings, you and I are the pinnacle of God's creation. We are the pinnacle of, his, of God's creation. And we have the potential and the capacity through a savoring relationship with Jesus Christ to know God. None of the other created order has that privilege and ability. And I don't care what PETA says, you and I are of infinite more value than anteaters and aardvarks. Amen. We are the pinnacle of God's creation. We have the capacity to know God through Christ that none of the other created order has. I love dogs. I do. I grew up with black labs. I love dogs. My wife got me a little dog for Christmas. And I, I just, I love dogs. But the greatest, smartest dog in the world will never know God because dogs are not created in God's image. And cats for sure aren't. But <laughs> Just kidding. Sort of. But we are. We have the potential and the capacity through a saving relationship with Jesus Christ to know God, but that does not mean that we are gods. The Bible is very clear. There is only one God. 
and he is a jealous God who will not share his glory with another. And if I remember my Bible correctly, wasn't the desire to be just like God kind of what led to this whole fall thing in the first place? Isn't that interesting? The very first temptation, which led to the very first sin, the desire to be just like God, is what led to this whole fallen state in the first place. And the faith preachers teach it as truth. They want you to believe it. They want you to receive it. The very thing that led to the fallen state in the first place. How ironic. Who else in the Bible wanted to be just like God? Satan did. Lucifer. He wanted all the worship that God was getting for himself. He wanted to dethrone God. And he rose up in rebellion against God. Not a good idea to do that. Rose up in rebellion against God and got him and a third of the angels along with him kicked out of heaven. So the little God's doctrine is quite literally, quite literally a doctrine of demons. Quite literally a doctrine of demons. And yet it is at the heart of of the prosperity gospel, the little God's doctrine at the heart of the prosperity gospel. We are gods. We are gods. Talk about an entitlement mentality. I want us to look at what the faith preachers teach about the doctrine of the fall. Word faith, New Apostolic Reformation, Hillsong, Bethel Church, all these guys. Word faith teachings on the fall. Number one, they teach that Adam was an exact duplicate of God. Adam was not a little like God. He was not a lot like God. That He literally was God. That God literally reproduced himself in Adam. Adam was a carbon copy of Yahweh. Carbon copy of Yahweh. Well, we all know what happened, right? Adam sinned. Which, of course, begs the question. If Adam was Yahweh and he sinned, was it Yahweh who sinned? You see, you carry these doctrines out to their logical conclusion. You see how dark they really are. But when Adam sinned, he lost his godhood, lost his deity, transferred it to Satan. When this happened, the real Yahweh God lost his legal right to, to planet Earth and was kicked out. And so according to classic word faith theology, the real Yahweh God is up there somewhere, but he's got no access to planet Earth. He's been kicked out, gone. See you later. Do they really teach that, that God's actually been kicked out of his own planet? Yep, they do. Let me show you. This is, a Kenneth, this is an email from Kenneth Copeland, March of last year. Kenneth Copeland said this. He said, but when he, referring to Adam, when Adam turned and gave that dominion to Satan, look where it left God. It left God on the outside looking in. He can't do anything down there. He had no legal right to do anything about it. Could he manipulate and operate? No, because he'd be doing the very same thing that Satan did in the first place. And if God had injected himself illegally into the earth, what Satan intended for him to do was to fall for it, pull off an illegal act and turn the light off in God and subordinate God to himself. Now you can see the complicated predicament that God's in. You can understand why someone would say, wonder why God lets all those wars go on. He doesn't. There's not anything he can do about it. Blasphemy. Well, according to the faith preachers, Satan is the legal God of planet Earth. We've already discussed how that is not true. Now, guess what happens when a person gets saved? Guess what he gets back? According to the faith preachers, guess what a person gets back when he becomes a Christian? Ah, he gets his godhood back. He regains his deity he becomes God again, just like Adam supposedly was before he fell. And this, dear friends, is why the faith preachers hold so tenaciously to health and wealth, because we're gods. And a God cannot be poor, and a God certainly cannot be sick, because we're gods. And this is, this is what makes the prosperity gospel so appealing and yet so dangerous at the same time because the prosperity preachers don't preach that Jesus came to die on the cross and to save us from the wrath of God. That's not the emphasis of their preaching. They say the cross is not about satisfying the wrath of God. The cross is all about you. 
Christ's sacrifice is about you because he wants to give you a, a cushy life. He wants to give you health. He wants to give you wealth. He wants to make you rich. That's why he died on the cross. Oh, surely, Justin, surely this time you're really taking them out of context. Judge for yourself. This is a tweet from Creflo Dollar. Jesus bled and died for us so that we can be saved from the wrath of God. Uh, no, no, that's not what he said. Jesus bled and died for us so that we can lay claim to the promise of financial prosperity. That's why Christ died on the cross, so we can be rich. Undoubtedly, the most aptly named of the prosperity preachers, Creflo Dollar. <laughs> Unreal. Softening of sin. All of the faith preachers soften sin. They don't talk about sin very much. Or if they do, here's how they talk about sin. You listen, you listen for it, and you'll hear it. Not that I'm encouraging you to listen to these prosperity preachers. But when they talk about sin, they don't really talk about you offending a thrice holy God. Sin's not about offending God. Sin is about keeping you, keeping yourself from having the best that God wants for you. God just wants to give you a nicer home and a nicer car, and, and he wants to help you to to lose weight the Jesus way and just do all these wonderful things for you. But if you sin, you might mess up God's plan for you and you don't, so you don't want to do that. It's blasphemy. It's blasphemy. I want you to watch this. To do this, but... Watch this video clip of Joseph Prince. Now, this is kind of tricky. We're going to have to be good Bereans with this. As Joseph Prince with Joel Osteen talks about repentance. Watch this. To do this, but you're getting the same kind of response, aren't you? People yes. need and, and want. You know, the word repentance, uh, like Joel said, is from the Greek word metanoia, which literally means change your mind. And uh, every time, like Joel or, or me, preaching the word, without using the word repentance sometimes, but people's minds are being changed all the time. From thinking this way negatively to thinking positively. So Joseph Prince says that the Greek word for repentance is metanoia. And you know what? He's right. That is a Greek word for repentance. And then he says metanoia means to change your mind. Guess what? Right again. That is what that word means. Metanoia means to change your mind. But then did you notice how he fleshed it out? He said, he said Joel and I may not use the word repentance. I mean, heaven forbid we actually use biblical terminology in our preaching, you know, wouldn't want to do that. So we may not use the word repentance, but we're still teaching people to repent when they go from thinking negatively to thinking positively. That's not repentance. According to his definition of repentance, we could all repent simply by joining the Optimist Club, just having a sunnier outlook on life. Everything's just sunshine and lollipops everywhere and rainbows. That's not repentance. Yes, repentance means a change in mind, but repentance comes when God grants repentance. God must grant it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 11, God grants repentance. And when God grants repentance, our minds are changed, yes, but everything about us is changed. Our affections are changed. Our, our, our lives are changed. Our disposition towards sin has changed. And there will be fruit in keeping with repentance. The Apostle Paul says, So, King Agrippa, I kept, de kept declaring that all people should repent and turn to God performing deeds appropriate to repentance. Now, does this mean we perform deeds in order to repent? No, that's getting the cart before the horse. That would be a work salvation. But when God grants repentance, there will be deeds in keeping with repentance. There will be fruit, a natural outflow of God's work in our life, deeds in keeping with repentance. John the Baptist, therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. If there has not been a change in your life, then there has been no repentance. 
there's been no repentance, there's been no conversion. Repentance is not just having a, it's not just seeing the glass half full. That's, that's not what repentance is at all. Good little rule of thumb in hermeneutics, how to rightly interpret the Bible. You know, metanoia means to change your mind. True, it does. I like word studies. It's good to know what a word is. But don't just rely on the dictionary definition of a word to know what that word means. Okay? Don't do that. Because that's not the final arbiter of the, of the, of the meaning of the word. N not Noah Webster. God. The Holy Spirit is the one who places the words in the text, in the context in which he desires them. And so you look at the context in how that word is being used. And you look at the context, that determines the meaning you know, dictionary definitions are good. They're helpful. I'm not against that. I'm not against lexicons. That's fine. But that's not the final arbiter. How is the word being used in context? Because it's the Holy Spirit. He determines the meaning of the word, not Noah Webster. Okay? And you see this with the word sozo. Salvation, you hear prosperity preachers say all the time. Oh, sozo talks about fullness in every area of life and in, in, in finances and healing and you know, sozo, we should be healed and prosperous. Can sozo be used that way? Yeah, it can. But that's not, the, that's not the meaning of it. You look at how the word is used in context. Do we not have the very same thing in English and even with the very same word? We talk about being saved, right? Being saved from sin. Is that the only way we use that word? You could save time. You could save money. You could save yourself a lot of trouble. You could save your breath. Same word. Very different meanings depending on how it's being used in context. Look at the context. Not just the dictionary definition, but the prosperity preachers are famous for doing that, or infamous, if you will. Oh, sozo means we should always be healed in you know, every area of our life. How's it being used in context? They soften sin. They soften sin. Watch this from Benny Hinn and Miles Monroe. Pastor, we get the mind of God about his will. We pray it. When we pray it, we give him legal right to perform it. Yes. Let me define prayer for you in this show. Prayer is man giving God permission or license to interfere in earth's affairs. In other words, prayer is earthly license for heavenly interference. That's incredible. That is incredible. God could do nothing on earth. Nothing has God ever done on earth without a human giving him access. So he's always looking for that somebody. Always looking for a human to give him power, permission. In other words, God has the power, but you get the permission. God got the authority and the power, but you got the license. So even though God could do anything, he can only do what you permit him to do. God can only do what we permit him to do. Dear friends, I would submit to you tonight that God can do whatever he jolly well wants to do. And is not terribly concerned about whether or not he has our permission to do it. This from Creflo Dollar. Instagram. I barely even know what Instagram is. I, I really don't. I'm so ignorant on social media. I, I don't know. I still don't know what a hashtag. I have no idea what a hashtag is. Every time I see a hashtag, I just have this insatiable desire to play tic-tac-toe. I don't, I don't know. True, I have I don't know. People send me this stuff. I, don't, I have no idea. I don't know what Instagram is. Creflo Dollar. He says, God needs your consent and co cooperation to bring forth manifestation in the earth. God needs your consent. He needs your permission. This is January this year. Friends, God can do whatever he wants to do. 
Don't take my word for it. Let's be good Bereans, search the scripture, see if these things are really so. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. But you know, I actually had someone, they looked at this verse, I showed it to them, and they said, that just means he can do whatever he wants to do in heaven, but not on earth. If he, has to, if he wants to do something on earth, he's got to get our permission. Hmm. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth. <laughs> in the seas and in all the deeps. Amen. Oops. Friends, God can do whatever he wants to do and is not losing a great deal of anthropomorphic sleep over whether or not he has our permission to do it. <laughs> Have you ever noticed the titles of their books? Have you ever noticed the um, titles of their books, titles of their television programs and whatnot, how man-centered they are? Very man-centered, just by looking at the titles. Joel Osteen's first book, Runaway Bestseller, what was it called? Your best life now, how much more man-centered can you get? You can have your best life, and you can have it right now. Is this true? Are we having our best life now? No. This isn't our best life. Our best life is not on this side of heaven. Our best life's on the other side of heaven. Not here. So for whom else would this be true? Lost people. If a, if a person dies in his or her sin, yeah. He or she is having his or her best life now. This is as good as it's going to get for them. But you know what? For us, this is as bad as it's going to get. Your best life now. Now, his second book, I'm not even sure why there would be a need for a second book. I mean, if, if you're already having your best life and you're having it right now, I'm not real sure how you improve upon that. But, but apparently there was a need for a second book. Become a better you. Become a better you. Is this a biblical concept? Well, who does the Bible say that we are? The Bible says that we're sinners, right? We're lawbreakers. It says that we're liars, thieves, blasphemers, adulterers at heart. Are we supposed to become better liars, better thieves, better blasphemers, better adulterers at heart? No. We're not to become better people. The gospel is not about some self-help, motivational, happy talk. We're not supposed to become better. We're supposed to become new. All things passed away. Behold, all things made new. His next book, It's Your Time. Whose time is it? God's time? Nope. Not God's time. It's your time. It's all about you. His next book. Every day is a Friday. Well, that's just, what? Yeah, yeah, he's stretching for it. Every day is a Friday. Let's just all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. Now, his next book, and I'll be honest, his next book, this one gets me angry. The, the title of this book angers me. The Power of I Am. You know what this book is about? Joel Osteen wants you to take the Tetragrammaton, the name for God, and apply it to yourself. And you make positive confessions over yourself using the name of God. I am talented. I am popular. I am all that in a bag of chips. This inflated view of self. Me, 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 me. All about me. Man-centered. Man-centered. Any gospel that is centered on man is a different gospel. Just as a general rule of thumb, if you're cruising around in a Christian bookstore, by the way, that's the most, you know, that's the most dangerous place a Christian could go, it's a Christian bookstore. You'd be safer on a SWAT team than walk into a Christian bookstore. But if you're, if you're in a Christian bookstore and you're, you're, you see a, a book or some books written by a particular author and you're kind of just wondering, maybe you're not real sure about who this guy or gal is and, and uh, you, know, you don't know if that's somebody you should read on, general rule of thumb, 
If you happen to notice that on all of their books is a big mugshot of themselves plastered all over the front, probably a pretty good indication you shouldn't buy that book. <laughs> this is personality driven. Good rule of thumb. And, and they're all like this. Look at all of Joyce Meyer's books. What does she have on the cover? Big picture of herself. It's, they all do that. Watch this from Jesse Duplantis. Friends have frank and open conversations with each other. I've done that with the Lord. I've had the Lord say, uh, Jesse, I've had God come tell me, say, this is what I'm going to do. I've had the Lord say, what do you think about this? God has asked me for my opinion. God asks Jesse Duplantis for his opinion? Really? Do tell. I said, well, Lord, since you ask, maybe I'm doing it. He said, no, we can talk frankly. What do you think? I said, well, I don't think you ought to do that. He said, why you don't think I ought to do that? I said, well, you know, I, I know you know people more than I do, but you know, Lord, if you just let me, let me do a little bit more work on this individual, I think we can get them to you. He says, okay, go ahead. Do what you have to do. And I tell you what, the Bible says he who wins souls is wise. And he who thinks he can counsel God is a fool. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as, his, or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? Well, apparently it was Jesse Duplantis. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Watch this from Jesse Duplantis. I'm, I'm going to say something going to knock your lights off. God has the power to take life, but he can't. he got the power to do it, but he won't. He's bound. He can't. He says death and life is in the power of whose tongue? Yours. You ready for this? You want something that will knock your lights off? You choose when you live. You choose when you die. God has the power to take life, but he can't. I think that might come as a bit of a surprise to a number of people in the Bible. Remember King Herod, when God killed him and he was eaten by worms? Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5, talk about being slain in the Spirit. They were slain by the Spirit. <laughs> remember, remember Uzzah? Remember Uzzah? The, the oxen were walking along, pulling the cart, Ark of the Covenant on the cart, and the oxen stumbled. And, and you can see this in your mind's eye, can't you? You know exactly how it happened. The oxen stumbled, and the Ark tilted, and Uzzah, standing right beside it, without even thinking, just instinctively, God struck him dead. You think God isn't holy? Who else would beg to differ from Mr. Duplantis? Well, let's think about, oh yeah, everybody alive on the face of the earth except for eight people in that little flood thing. I bet they would beg to differ with Jesse Duplantis. Unbelievable. I want us now to look at what the faith preachers teach about the person and work of Jesus Christ. If we can establish that they preach a different Jesus, we can establish that they do indeed preach a different gospel. Many of the faith preachers have what is essentially called an Arianistic view of Christ, Arianism. Arianism was a heresy in the early church that basically held that Jesus did not come as God. He was just a man, a man who had a very close walk with God but was not actually God in human flesh. That Jesus later, later became God but he didn't come as God. This from Creflo Dollar. Creflo Dollar says, 
And somebody said, well, Jesus came as God. Well, how many of you know the Bible says God never sleeps nor slumbers? And yet in the book of Mark, we see Jesus asleep in the back of the boat. Jesus came as a man. And at age 30, God is now getting ready to demonstrate to us and give us an example of what a man with the anointing can do. Y'all, please listen to me. Please listen to me. This ain't, no, this ain't no heresy. I'm not some false prophet. Again, as a little general rule of thumb, if a preacher actually has to tell you that he's not a false prophet, <laughs> chances are. So Creflo Dollar says, because Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat and God never sleeps nor slumbers and therefore Jesus could not have been God. That's ridiculous. Dear friends, when Jesus came to this earth, he came as 100% God and 100% man. He was the God man. We refer to the theanthropic, theos, anth theos, God, anthropos, man, the theanthropic person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ on earth, as he is now, one person, two natures. One person, two natures. Human, divine. And as the God-man, Jesus experienced many of the same things that you and I experience. He got hungry. He got thirsty. Guess what? He got sleepy. It does not mean that he was not God. That is ridiculous. It's a sure sign of a false teacher. Why do they teach this? Because, you see, Jesus was just a man with the anointing. Guess what we are? We're men and women with the anointing. And so, therefore, we are just like Christ. All the rights, all the privileges. Never be sick. This from Kenneth Copeland. And Jesus volunteered to go to hell. I'm going to tell you something. Ain't nobody ever got out of there. The only thing he had to go by was the promise of God that I'm reading you right now. He didn't have some special revelation from heaven between he and God the Father. No, the Bible said he emptied himself when he came and he saw himself in the word and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He found himself in the word. So according to Kenneth Copeland, Jesus was just a man, just a man who walked into the synagogue one day and opened up the scriptures and started reading it, kind of read along and along. All of a sudden he said, whoa, whoa. Well, I'll be John Brown. Look, look at here. Look who I am. He had no idea who he was. He just found himself in the Word. No special relationship, you see, between Jesus and God the Father. He just found himself in the Word. That is heresy. If they preach a different Jesus, they preach a different gospel. Amen. What of this? Now, did you hear Kenneth Copeland say that Jesus emptied himself? Did he? Did Jesus empty himself? Philippians chapter 2. Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being made in the likeness of men. Hmm. Well, it does indeed say that Jesus emptied himself. So is Kenneth Copeland right? No, he's not question is, is what does this mean? Jesus emptied himself. What does it mean? Of what did he empty himself? Did he empty himself of his deity? No. No, he did not. Did he empty himself of any of his divine attributes? Now, some people say that he did. Some people say when Jesus was on earth, he was not omniscient. Because of that statement he made of that day and hour, no one knows, remember? Not the angels in heaven, not the Son, but only the Father. And because of that statement, a lot of people think that Jesus did not know some things, that he emptied himself of his omniscience. He em that's one of the God's incommunicable attributes, an attribute that God does not share with us. 
So, is that what he did? Did Jesus empty himself of his omniscience, of any of his attributes? No, he did not. God is the summation of his attributes. If you take away even one of God's attributes, do you still have God? Nope. You can't have 90% God. It's, it's an all or nothing deal. Either he is or he isn't. You take away one of God's attributes, you no longer have God. So what does this mean? What is this? Well, let's let Scripture interpret Scripture. Let's go to the Gospel of John. The disciples said to Jesus, Now we know that you know all things. Now, if Jesus did not know all things, what a great opportunity for Jesus to do what? To correct their theology. What a great opportunity for Jesus to say, now, wait a minute, guys. Hold on just a second. I can understand how you think I know all things. I understand where you got that idea, but I really don't. I used to before I came to this earth, and one day I will again, but right now for the time being, I don't. What a great opportunity for Jesus to correct their theology. I mean, the ball is sitting on the tee, right, ready to be knocked out of, knocked out of the park. Is that what Jesus did? No, he didn't. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Do you now believe? Jesus did not correct them. He affirmed them. Do you now believe? He's saying, yes, I do know all things. So what do we do with that statement of that day and hour? No one knows, not the angels in heaven, not the Son of Man, only the Father. What do we do with that? Jesus did not empty himself of his deity, nor did he empty himself of any of his divine attributes. But on occasion, on occasion, Jesus did empty himself of his divine prerogative to exercise some of those attributes. It does not mean he didn't have them. It does not mean he didn't have access to the information. It just means on occasion, he emptied himself of his divine prerogative to exercise them. Okay? This from Kenneth Copeland According to Kenneth Copeland, Jesus, quote-unquote, physically appeared to him and said this to him. Don't be disturbed when people accuse you of thinking you are God. They crucified me for claiming that I was God, but I didn't claim I was God. I just claimed that I walked with him. He was in me. Hallelujah. That's what you're doing. Blasphemy. Jesus most certainly did claim to be God. Before Abraham was, I am. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Jesus most certainly did claim to be God. And any Jesus that he's preaching who did not claim to be God is not the Jesus of the Bible. If they preach a different Jesus, they preach a different gospel. Never to be outdone with himself. This also from Kenneth Copeland. And I say this with all respect so it don't upset you too bad, but I say it anyway. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and I say, I am too. That God has not struck these people dead is a testimony to his patience and forbearance. Watch this from Larry Huck and Paula White. begin to understand that, that that when Jesus Christ paid the price the first thing that happened after he said it is finished is the veil was rent from top to bottom signifying that no man could do that but the price that was paid was there's now no separation so that we have direct access in the Holy of Holies we understand according to Hebrews that Jesus is our high priest Absolutely. and he's the first of many brethren which means I now come into a priestly anointing so I now can say walk. that again because now, they don't get it. I now come into a priestly anointing. Jesus is not the only begotten on. Son of God. He is not. I'm a Son of he's God. He's the first fruit. You're the, you're the, he's the first fruit. He's the first born of many. Anointing. Jesus is not the only begotten on. Son of God. Can you believe that? Flat out denying that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God? Have they read John 3.16? Friends, we're not talking here about who you think wrote the book of Hebrews. We're not talking here about whether you're pre-trib or mid-trib in your eschatology. These issues go to the heart of the gospel. What one believes about Jesus Christ will determine where one spends eternity. 
If they preach a different Jesus, they preach a different gospel, and a different gospel does not save. Does not save. They have a different Jesus, and they all teach this, all of them. You may as well be a Muslim as be word of faith. These people are not Christians. Oh, Justin, are you saying that they're not even saved? That's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. It, yes, and that's the thing. If, you are, if a person is truly indwelt by the third person of the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit of God would not allow you to say something like that. The first time, the first time some blasphemy like that ever crossed their lips, the Holy Spirit of God would drop them to their knees. He would be screaming at them. The Holy Spirit, if He is strong enough to save us, He is also strong enough to deliver us out of deception. You cannot teach that kind of blasphemy and be indwelt by Him. It is not possible. The Holy Spirit is not some effeminate, tie-dyed wearing hippie. He's strong. And as I said this morning, it's kind of ironic that these people, they would accuse me, oh, you don't believe in the Holy Spirit. You don't believe that he works. To the contrary. To the contrary. Watch this from Victoria Osteen. You see, Jesus walked this earth in a human body. He was man. He was God made flesh. The Bible says he was tempted and tried in every way, just like we are, but he overcame. See, Jesus was man until God touched him and put the spirit of the living God on the inside of him. And that's encouraging today. No, that's heretical today. Jesus was just a man until God touched him. That's, a, that's some, it's called adoptionism. That's an ancient heresy that was done away with centuries ago. They continue to attack the person and work of Jesus Christ. Watch this video clip from Rod Parsley. This is going to go by really fast, but it's one of those things. Kathy and I were sitting on the couch just watching TBN. People think I watch TBN all the time. I don't. I really don't. The thing is, is you don't have to watch much Christian television before you start seeing this stuff. I mean, it's on all the time. But watch this from Rod Parsley. Because when Naaman obeyed that instruction, the miracle of God was released, just like I'm believing with you right now. Somebody's laying hold on a miracle. I can, I can perceive it. I, I can perceive that virtue's going forth out of me. I feel your faith pulling on me right now. Rod Parsley said, I perceive virtue is going forth out of me. You perceive what? Of course, when we hear that, we automatically think of what story in the New Testament? The woman with the issue of blood, right? Touched the hem of Jesus' garment. Jesus said, who touched me? For I feel, I perceive virtue has flown out of me. He feels virtue going out of him? And he says, I feel your faith tugging on me. You feel what? You, Rod Parsley, feel my faith tugging on you. So I guess Rod Parsley should be the object of our faith. We could just ask Rod Parsley to come into our hearts. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Dear friends, these people aren't Christians. They are not saved. You cannot be indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God and say something like that. The very first time they would have said something like that, the Holy Spirit would have dropped them. And yet they continue to teach this stuff year after year after year after year. They have been called on it 
and yet they keep doing it. That's not a Christian. That's not a Christian. Our last section here, I want us to talk about, whoops, sometimes it jumps to a slide I don't intend it to. I want us to look at the spiritual death of Jesus, spiritual death of Jesus. All of the faith preachers teach this, that Jesus' physical death was not enough to atone for sins, that Jesus died on the cross, then he went to hell, suffered, was tormented, tortured by the demons, ceased to be God. The spiritual death of Jesus. Jesus had to go through that same spiritual death in order to pay the price. Now, it wasn't the physical death on the cross that paid the price for sin because if it had been, any prophet of God that had died for the last couple of thousand years before that could have paid that price. It wasn't physical death. Anybody could do that. It wasn't the physical death of Jesus that paid for our sins. Anybody could have done that. No, Mr. Copeland, nobody else could have done that because no one else is sinless. Spiritual death of Jesus. Why is this such a dangerous doctrine? They all teach this, by the way. Even Joel Osteen, believe it or not, has taught the spiritual death of Jesus. If Jesus went to hell, as hard as that is to even say, if Jesus went to hell and was tortured by the demons, died a spiritual death, dear friends, then that means he ceased to be God. Because God is spirit, right? John chapter 4, God is spirit. The Bible makes very, three very short, clear, concise about statements about who God is. God is love, God is light, and God is spirit. And we, and we must worship him in spirit and truth. So if Jesus died spiritually, and God is spirit, but Jesus died spiritually, then that means he ceased to be God. And if Jesus ceased to be God even for an instant, then he never was God to begin with. Because God cannot cease to be God. Oftentimes we think, oh, God's omnipotent. He can do anything. Are there things that God cannot do? Yes. Trick question. There are things that God cannot do. God cannot lie. God cannot sin. God cannot deny himself. God cannot cease to be God. And so if there was ever a time, if he ceased to be God even for an instant, then he never was God to begin with. Hebrews 13, 8, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. We call that the immutability of God. He does not change. Well, people say, well, what about what Jesus said on the cross? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, the prosperity preachers, word faith, N-A-R, they all say that this is talking about the spiritual death of Jesus. Now, you will hear this verse taught in a, in a little bit different way in a lot of non-word of faith churches. And you, you'll probably have heard something like this. When Jesus was on the cross, God the Father turned his back on the Son. Right? You've heard this? Turned his back on the Son and abandoned the Son because of what Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Be very careful with that. We've already established that Jesus could not cease to be God. Now, if Jesus was abandoned by the Father and that relationship between Father and Son was broken, as a lot of preachers say, that that relationship was severed, just like you cut a ribbon, and then you have two ribbons. Be very careful with that. Because if that's what happened, if the, if, the, if the relationship between father and son was severed, now we've got two independent, coexisting gods. We can't have that either. We're not polytheists. We don't believe in many gods. One God, three persons, one God. So what do we do with this? What, what, is, what is Jesus saying? Jesus is quoting Psalm chapter 22, verse 1. A couple things to remember. The chapter divisions and the verse numbers were not in the original manuscripts. You understand that, I think, right? Man put those in there just to help us look things up a little bit more easily in the Bible. The way the Jews would have referenced a passage in the Old Testament, they wouldn't have said 
Okay, turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 4, verse whatever. They would have quoted the first verse of the context, and then you would have known. So when Jesus quoted verse 1, everybody who heard him, who knew the Scriptures, they would think automatically this context. They wouldn't think Psalm 22, but they would think the context. Well, let's look at the context, okay? Let's look down a few verses. Same context, same chapter. The psalmist, David, continues. He says, Be not far from me, O Lord, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither has he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. David had gotten to this point, the psalmist David, had gotten to this point in his life where he felt like he had been abandoned by God. That's why he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what he felt like. But aren't you glad we don't base our theology off of our feelings and our emotions? In reality, you see, David had not been abandoned by God. He says it very clearly. Be not far from me, O Lord. He has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither has he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. He heard. Jesus was applying this to himself. Dear friends, when Jesus was on the cross, the agony of the cross was the nails, yes. Was the crown of thorns, yes. The flagellation, yes. The thirst, yes. It was, it was all of that. But it was more than that. Because when Jesus was on the cross, the full, undiluted fury of God's wrath was being poured out on the Son. And Jesus was our propitiation, our, our wrath-removing sacrifice. In other words, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, when Jesus laid down his life on the cross, he drank in every drop of the wrath of God and he satisfied it. And so, yes, the agony of the cross was more than just the physical suffering. There was a spiritual element there, too. Absolutely. But we cannot take that too far. And there's a mystery there that I don't think any of us will ever fully understand this side of the cross. But I think it may well be said in his humanity. Remember, Jesus is one person, two natures. Two natures. In his human nature, when he was on the cross, undoubtedly Jesus felt real estrangement, real abandonment, absolutely. But in his deity, Jesus was never separated from the Father, never. When he cried unto him, he heard. And David says it right here, he has not hidden his face from him. What else did Jesus say on the cross? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Jesus was praying to the Father on the cross. And so we know that those lines of communication, if you will, within the triune Godhead were still very much intact. Jesus was praying to the Father. He cried unto him and he heard. Jesus was never separated from the Father in his deity. You know what's interesting about Psalm 22? You can read the entire psalm. You know what you will not find in that psalm? Zero confession of sin. No confession of sin in Psalm 22. Jesus applied that to himself. Don't you just marvel at the majesty of Scripture? Something that you'll notice, dear friends, about every cult is every cult disparages the cross of Jesus Christ. That it somehow just was not enough to pay for sins. Mormons disparage it. Jehovah's Witnesses disparage it. Roman Catholics disparage the cross of Jesus Christ. That it was not enough to pay for sins. 
I want to show you a couple of verses real quick, and we'll wrap up. Colossians 1, verse 19 through 20, Jesus made peace through the what? The blood of his cross. Peter says, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive, quickened by the Spirit of God. There were not two deaths of Jesus, one physical, one spiritual, one death once for all. Jesus said, it is finished. His work was completed on the cross. Catholics, Catholics believe when they have mass, you know, they call it the sacrifice of the mass. Just out of curiosity, any former Catholics in here? Okay. Catholics, when they have the sacrifice, the communion, they call it the sacrifice of the mass. According to official Roman Catholic doctrine, the priest, when he takes the communion elements, the wafer and the, and the wine, that he is literally given power to change those elements into the literal flesh of Jesus, the cracker and the literal blood, the wine. The priest is given power not to ask Jesus to come out of heaven and get it a little cracker, but to pull him out of heaven. This is official Roman Catholic doctrine. The priest is given power to pull Christ out of heaven, and official Roman Catholic doctrine says that Jesus, quote, bows his head in humble submission to the priest. And that little wafer, that little cracker turns in not to the symbolic flesh of Jesus, the actual flesh of Jesus Christ. That's why they worship that thing. That's why they put the little cracker in the, in the golden cross and they have the perpetual adoration. People stay with that thing 24-7. They worship it. Because they think Jesus is in that cracker. And the priest takes a cracker and he lifts it up and he says, we offer up this victim. Victim. Think of it. Dear friends, Jesus never was, is not now, nor will he ever be a victim. He is the ultimate victor. And they sacrifice him. The sacrifice of the mass they are sacrificing Jesus. To put it in, in everyday language, they're killing him. They're killing Christ over and over and over and over every single time Catholics have mass, sacrifice of the mass. Thousands and thousands of times in churches, all, Catholic churches all over the world, every day. And yet, could Peter not be more clear? Christ died for sins once for all. What is unclear about that? And Catholics don't believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Catholics believe you've got to add works to your faith. You've got to go to confession. And you've got to confess your sins to a priest who's just as sinful, if not more so, than you are. And he'll he'll tell you, you've got to say your Our Fathers. You've got to say your Hail Marys. And so, so you say that, and you say 35 Our Fathers and 43 Hail Marys, and you pray the rosary, and you do this, you do that, and you do works. You add works to your faith. That's a different gospel. You know what we contribute to our salvation? Our sin. That's it. And when Catholics teach that when you die, you you get to go to purgatory and have all your other sins burned up that Jesus somehow didn't pay for. And you spend who knows how long in purgatory, and if you're loved ones back on earth want to get you out of purgatory a little bit faster, they can always give the Catholic Church some money, some indulgences, get you out of purgatory a little bit faster. That's an offense to the gospel. That is a different gospel. It is a cult. The Roman Catholic Church is the largest organized theological cult in the world. Do I hate Roman Catholics? No, I don't. I love Roman Catholics, but I do hate Roman Catholicism. Because Jesus hates it. Uh, let me show you this. The Pope. Titles of the Pope. 
Holy Father. They call their Pope Holy Father. God the Father. The Pope is also the head of the church. Who does the Bible say the head of the church is? Jesus. And the Pope is the vicar of Christ. Vicar means substitute. Substitute of Christ on earth. Who is the substitute of Christ on earth? The Holy Spirit. Remember before Jesus ascended, it is good that I leave you. Because he will send the comforter. The Holy Spirit is here. The Pope has all three titles. For the Father, for the Son, for the Holy Spirit. He's God on earth. And if we love our Roman Catholic friends enough, we should love them enough to tell them the truth. We should love them enough to tell them the truth. I hope this has been helpful for you, dear friends. This is just a jet tour over the word faith movement, a little bit of Roman Catholicism. So uh, thank you for coming tonight. Tomorrow night, Lord willing, we'll be gathering again at 6 o'clock. Tomorrow night, mangled manifestations. Tomorrow night, we'll be looking... And some of the more dramatic things of the word faith movement will be looking, as I said this morning, at the abuse of tongues. We'll be looking at being slain in the spirit. We'll be looking at these claims of people who say they've been to heaven and write books about going to heaven. We'll talk about all of that, uh, Lord willing, tomorrow night. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, Pastor Chuck. Uh, if you have questions, you can write them down and come and give oh, yeah. them to me right now. Justin's going to take some questions right now. If you think about a question between now and tomorrow, you can write it down and give it to me, and we'll uh, get those questions. i got one question here now. If you have one, just write it down and bring it up to me right now. Um, <clears throat> we want to be able to handle those or make sure that we know. But, Justin, here's one um, <clears throat> that was asked. Um, it says, Justin... How does Pastor Chuck compare to... No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> uh, how does the TV preachers that you talk about accept your teaching, number one? Number two, have they ever threatened you in any way? Number, and then number three, have you ever feared for your life? Hmm. Um, no, I haven't, I haven't feared for my life. Uh, and I... And I don't say this to sound super spiritual or anything, but the, the safest place in the world you can be is in the middle of God's will, whatever that looks like. That's the safest place, and, and the best of my knowledge, that's, that's what I'm doing, God's will for my life. So I'm not, I'm not worried about my life per se. Uh, as far as how do they receive my teaching, <laughs> not too good. They, <laughs> they, they, uh, they don't like me. I've never heard from them. Uh, I've never heard from Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland or one of these others, and, and I know why I haven't, because I got a little insider information. A few years ago, there was a guy named uh, Doran, Doran, Doran uh, who lives out in California. Long story short, Doran emailed me first, and we talked on the phone, but he used to be in the Word of Faith movement, and he used to be pretty high up in it, and he used to preach Word of Faith theology, and he would rub shoulders with all the people that we've been looking at tonight. He knows them. And uh, God saved him out of it. And he'll tell you he wasn't saved when he was in the Word of Faith movement. God saved him out of the Word of Faith movement. Uh, he said, but he said, they know about you. And I said, they do. So I always wondered. I've never heard from them. You know? And uh, he said, oh, yeah. He said, you've been the subject of many board meetings. And I said, really? <laughs> he said, oh, yeah. He said, they hate you. Um, he said, but you'll never hear from them. And I said, why? And he said, if they were to come after you, if they were to attack you, that would just raise your profile because it might make the news, you know, or something like that. And he said, they figure the fewer people who know about you, the better. So they're not going to attack you. They're not going to do that to raise your profile. He said, they hope you get hit by a bus. Um, but he said, you'll never hear from them. So... Yeah, I mean, why don't they just kill me with their words, you know, just. So, by the way, if I were to die, I don't think there's anything to positive confession from the word faith preacher. So, who knows, you know, I may die before I 
leave tonight. Who knows? But anyway. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that, I, that, that uh, is great about uh, the partnership of this is, is the word of God is flawless. It's inerrant. There's no error. The word of God is everything. It's the foundation for all. And we are all to be caretakers, so to speak, of the word of God in his purity to make sure. That's why we are doing this. It's a pastor's job to make sure that you're doing that, to make sure that you're abiding in that, that you're walking in that. And it's, 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 no, it's no wonder that the word of God is what's attacked and twisted and, and in all these things. So that's what we're doing here. What I love, what, just, what I've been telling you guys since I've been here is that if you change the conditions of salvation, if you change who Jesus is, is it a different gospel? Is it a different Jesus? And if they're believing in a Jesus whose death on the cross was not enough, then they're not saved. They can't that's be right. saved that's because right. they're not believing in what God's word says. Does that make sense? And we're not here making fun of them. We're not here just laughing up. These things, some of these things are laughable in the sense, but we don't want to do that in some kind of hierarchy, you know, we're better. We know the truth, and, but in all, in all essence, it's tragic. This is tragic stuff. There's people that, you know, Justin, I don't know if you're going to go into this, but there are little old ladies that are living off of, you know, the smallest income that they have that will send these guys their money, praying and believing for a miracle for their family members and for them, and they will eat dog food. They will go buy the 48 cents of dog food. There's story after story of this stuff, you guys. This yep. stuff is real. Yep. And I, I cannot, as a pastor, cannot let this happen. I can't let others walk in this because it's not the truth. And that's what I'm trying to do. That's what Justin is trying to do. And I'm just so appreciative. As a pastor, I'm so happy that, that I'm not just the only one to say things. And also, I'm glad that there's a partnership here. And there's a partnership for us that we have to, you know, um, with all due diligence. Pretty sure you'll share where the God's Word says, if anyone, even a demon, preaches a different gospel, have nothing to do with that, you know. So, guys, this journey that we're on, you got to finish it. Tomorrow and Tuesday, whatever you got, ask your questions this is a safe place to seek. We are not going to make fun of anybody if you ask any question. We love you. We will speak the truth in love, and it will be founded on God's Word. That sound like a deal? Because we're all growing in this. Here's one question. I know I know the answer to this, but I'll let you answer it. Okay. Is Sylvia Brown a part of this movement? No, Sylvia Brown's not a part of the movement per se, no, uh, of course she's dead now. But uh, Sylvia Brown was a psychic on the Montel Williams show all the time, uh, does these cold readings. Now, she shares a lot in common with the Word Faith Preachers as far as her tactics go. Uh, there's a, an awful lot of common ground with their tactics, but in and of itself, no, she was just a, a fake psychic. All psychics are fake, by the way. I mean, so. Uh, and it just kind of goes back down to the foundation of metaphysical, that whole, all the just mind over matter type stuff that you find. By the way, next Sunday I am preaching and I'm ending this whole series on Mormonism. And it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. The more I look at Word of Faith, I mean, I've known this, but really how yeah. similar it really is. It's, yep. it's bizarre. I got to tell you this, and I know I didn't tell you this at lunch, but we have an assembly guy. Remember um, Pastor Guerrero Santiago that was here? A couple weeks ago, he's at times in our district and in the Missouri district. And some of God, he's a he's actually a, a a missionary of cults. He was he actually worked for Watchtower at one point. Oh, and he saved the guy's a great guy. We had to come here and talk about Joe's witness. He's had churches, Assembly of God churches, drop him because there's been times he's called out Benny Hinn, and you know him. He's the sweetest guy. Not that Justin isn't sweet. But he's just like the super, like, quiet, you know, hey, you know, this. And, just, and, the, and the pastor comes off. He's had churches been dropping him because he's talking about these things. And I said, let me know their names because I'm going to call the district because I need to turn that guy in. 
because he needs to have his theology and doctrine corrected. Do I love that pastor? Yes. But can I have that knowledge and let that pastor continue? We can't. We, we have to guard these things. Anyways, all right. I'm sorry. I haven't preached in a few weeks, so I'm trying to. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm twitching here. So. I understand. Uh, but I'm very passionate about this stuff. Uh, here's another question. What started you on this journey? Oh, uh, yeah, good question. Well, this morning, as I said, uh, when I was a teenager, I was exposed to the Word Faith movement when this neighbor of mine said, Justin, God has spoken to me, and he's told me that he's going to heal you as long as you have enough faith. And uh, this guy it sadly died about a year ago. But uh, this guy was always claiming God spoke to him. You know, God's always speaking to him in dreams and visions. God seemed to talk to Charlie more than he did to Moses. You know, he's just one of these guys. And uh, so I went to see R.W. Schambach. I went to see Nora Lamb. I went to see some other couple, a couple of more local faith healers. Um, obviously was not healed. Years later, I started to study the movement at a more academic, biblical level. Began to realize how heretical the movement is. Uh, I did my first seminar in October of 2004. Um, I wrote a series of articles for the Baptist Record, a paper in the Mississippi uh, that goes out to Baptist churches in Mississippi and a few other states um, on the Word of Faith movement. They asked me to write because I wrote my master's thesis on Benny Hinn. I wrote my master in seminary. I wrote my thesis on Benny Hinn, and uh, so I wrote this series of articles. And a pastor in Alabama read them and asked me to come teach at his church, teach on this movement. And so I was just beginning to kind of put the beginning stages of this seminar together. And, and uh, so I went to his church in October of 2004. And ever since then, uh, it's just kind of snowballed. I've, I've never advertised. I've never, it's just word of mouth. And, and I've been doing it pretty much full time ever since. So, and I'm always adding stuff. I mean, you can see tonight some of the, some of the stuff I had was from this year. So, unfortunately, there's no shortage of material. I mean, it's just, a, I'm, I don't guess I'll ever run out of material. I wish I would, but... but. We'll pray that you will, right? Wouldn't that be... Yeah, I would good. love it. I would love, to, would love to not have to do these seminars. Yeah. I wish I didn't have to do them. And that's the heart of, of, of somebody, a true preacher. Like, that's my heart, too. Like, you know, I want to be able to go on to the deeper, the more grand, the let's get focused on our mission while we're here, and growing in God, and that's what we want. But, but this is part of what we are to be doing as the church. Uh, it's not just a, guys, understand, this isn't just a, a Justin and Pastor Chuck thing. This isn't just a preacher thing. We are all supposed to be making sure that we're supposed to know ourselves. And that's the whole thing is when you know, then, then you know how to defend. You're not tossed back and forth. So, uh, guys, any more questions that we have here today? Yeah, Jeff, uh, is, is it okay if we do a mic one? Yeah, sure. Why okay. Not? I listen in the afternoons to Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible Answer Man. Uh, that's where I got my first teaching of about the Word of Faith movement and the Osteenification of America. Do you support him? Is he a good source? Uh, yeah, the question about Hank Hanegraaff. I, Hannah Graff is good with apologetics and cult type stuff. He's he's fine. I mean, everything I've everything I've seen from him in that arena is fine. He would not be my go-to guy for theology. I have some pretty significant differences in some other areas of theology from him. But um, so cult and apologetics, yeah. But um, he wouldn't be my go-to guy for theology. He, I wouldn't. He wouldn't be my go-to preacher or anything like that. One of the things that we're also talking about to make sure we clarify, too, and I want to, make, and it's fine if you want to clarify that with, with Hank Hanegraaff, uh, equip.org, is um, where we disagree, you guys heard me teach in Act 1 about we major on the majors, we minor on the minors. There, Justin and I, if we even email the talk, we don't agree on everything. We're totally fine with that. But we agree and we know that what we disagree on are minors. It's like some of the things that Justin said, oh, pre-trib, you know, post-trib. Okay, so what? That doesn't change your salvation. But if I was to tell Justin, hey, you know, if you don't, uh, you know, if you don't bark like a dog, you're not saved. He says, well, if you don't meow like a cow, which cows don't meow, but if you don't meow like a cow, you're not saved. You know, then there's a problem there. So salvation things. So is Hank something where it is, 
It's not on, the, and that's where it's heretical when it changes those conditions. But just so people know, like, oh, okay, bam, we're putting Hank over here with Benny Hinn. We're not doing that, right? No, 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 no. Okay. No. So we're just talking on the minors. Those are minor differences. Like, hey, I believe this, I believe that. So we want to make sure that we understand that here. Because when we call out some of these people, we want to make sure that we're doing. Does that, does that help? I don't want to make sure we got that. We got uh, one more. Do we have? Did you? Okay. If you have questions, write them out and give them to me, guys. Um, so I'm super excited that I decided to come and that you were here this morning when we would normally come to church anyway, because I may not have, um, because this is, it's really enlightening, but the whole uh, origination of the Word of Life movement worth, verse, or Word of Faith um, is confusing because, you know, I've been taught that the Bible says, you know, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move, and the mountain will move. Mm -hmm. And so I've always believed in words of faith, but not a word of faith movement. In other words, not to the a point, you know, the Holy Spirit indwells us and, and, and gives us power. But that power is only the power of Jesus Christ, not me. Mm -hmm. Um but it just kind of it's, it get, gets confusing in that because I've always been taught, you know, speak life. Don't speak death into things. I don't believe I can speak things into existence, but not, be, not harboring on negativity of things. Um, I don't know if I'm making any sense with this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, you know, in talking about when we constantly are speaking death into things that we're given Satan power. Um, so I don't know. I guess all of that is a little bit confusing. I most certainly don't take any of it, any of it um, where I think I'm a little God or that any of this power is mine. It's all Jesus. But what would you say for people that are in that situation who aren't really learning more about the differences of that? Does that make any sense? I, I think so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well... As, as I said, dealing with positive confession, yes, our words do have impact on people. They can hurt people very much so. Uh, and we should set our minds on the things of God. You know, we should, whatever is pure and lovely, you know, think on these things. We should, we should set our minds on the things of God and, uh, and, and meditate on his word and read and study and obey his word, all those things. But it's not that our, our thoughts have it's not like our thoughts can affect physical reality and that's what the faith preachers teach you know and and sure you don't want to go around all day in the doldrums and you know saying what was me and well the reason you don't want to do it is not because you're going to enact some universal law of attraction the reason you don't want to do it is because complaining is a sin <laughs> you know so it that's why we so everything is everything that we need is in god's word it's sufficient for us and so uh, we think on the things of God, we meditate on his word, we obey his word, and then you trust God for the results. You trust God for the results. You know, and we shouldn't go around, uh, you know, binding Satan or trying to exercise demons or stuff like that. You know, that's not, a, that's not an ability that we even have today. Uh, you, you pray to the one who does have control over these things. You pray to the one who is in control of the physical reality, who is in control of demons, who is in control of the weather. Who is, we go to him, and, and even having faith the size of a mustard seed, when you look at that in context, Jesus says, whatever you ask in prayer, so the context of that is prayer, not literally speaking things into existence or you know, casting out demons or rebuking Satan. By the way, when you read the book of Jude, and you'll see this in the Truth of Territory stuff, uh, when you read the book of Jude, there's an interesting passage in there. It says that Michael and the archangel were having a dispute over the body of Moses. Kind of a curious thing there. I don't know exactly what that looked like, but Michael and the I mean, uh, Michael the archangel and Satan were having a dispute over the body of Moses. And it says that Michael the archangel would not dare pronounce a reviling accusation against Satan. Rather, Michael the archangel said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. So if Michael the archangel wouldn't rebuke Satan, 
probably a pretty good idea that we not want to do it. You know, this movie War Room, remember War Room last year? It was so popular. And there was that scene when Elizabeth, the main character, I bind you, Satan, I rebuke you. are not, don't be talking to Satan, ever. Okay? Michael the Archangel wouldn't do it, so we probably shouldn't either. So, anyway, all that to say. Um, and, and Renee, uh, and I say this from somebody that, you know, uh, wasn't raised, you know, in it. And so, even from 15 when I got saved, sort of looking is. It's, it's the entirety of Scripture. That's how you do it as well. So we don't just go, okay, here's what I've always been taught, and here's what they told me. That's why I give you notes for my sermons. That's why Justin does that. I'll give you the Scripture reference that I'm using, what version, so you can go back and you can look because we test these things. So, okay, so, uh, you know, faith, uh, uh, okay, uh, uh, you know, where they say in the, pro, in the Psalms about, or the Proverbs about uh, power of life and death, right? Well, then like what Justin says, you got to apply everywhere where it talks about speaking and talking. So then you get from James where it says, well, you know, our tongue is like a fire. You know, it can start a fire. It's like, so what we're looking at is, is the entirety of Scripture. And that's how you come up with doctrine. That's how you come up with what the Bible says. So that's a way that we do this too. But what happens a lot of times is, I don't mean this in a bad way. I'm not saying this is you. But we, it's easy to get lazy if you know every seven days you're going to go somewhere, someone's going to teach you the Word of God, right? Why do I really need to read it? My pastor's going to give me something that's going to keep me busy enough for seven days because I'm still trying to get the basics down in my life, right? Right? So that's our mentality, and that's why we're always saying, read the Word, read the Word, read the Word. And then read the word in these original language and in the context that it's saying. So that way you don't get caught off guard. You don't get caught up. Because even if you're just listening to a sermon here and a sermon there and it's even every week, you're still not even getting the fullness of it as if you're working every day and you're searching and you're adding and you're growing, you know, with that. So, uh, and you wouldn't just eat once a week, you know. So, and I'm not saying you did that, but that's something else that helps us too as we we seek and we grow and, you know, do these searches on where God's word says everything about that. And you go back to the original language, so, right? That, right. that helped? Yep, yep. 